All right. So this, this week, we're going to talk about user interface and user experience. And I want to be clear, this is, this is definitely going to be a little bit more of a conceptual week. It's talking about kind of ideas rather than any specific thing, which is, I think, going to be really fascinating. There is a lot to unpack, and I certainly am not by any means a, a master or expert on this. Also, it's worth mentioning up front that user, that UI UX designers are, is totally a full on career that exists in the tech space that's specifically for websites uh, and how that works. There's also just by the sheer proliferation of like unboxing videos, the user experience from getting a product, unboxing it, installing, using it, and then how do you dispose of it is its own whole type of engineering that's like cradle to grave design is typically what that's called. But the, the main piece that we're going to think about is just like a subset of all of that one niche that really applies to what you do in Makehaven, which is to think about it as, as like the maker version of all of that, because it's a part of every project that you make very likely. Uh, and so we're going to try and define some things. Mostly I want to bring in examples, just a heaping pile of examples for us to start to explore these ideas, what they look like, to talk about so that they become an open part of the discussion while you're thinking about how do you build something and, and what do you do. And mostly we're going to talk about gizmos and, and gadgets uh, for a lot of this time, but it's really useful, I think, to also imagine like how does a person interact with a piece of art, or we're going to look at instruments as examples. So we're going to try and explore this in ways that don't necessarily just mean electronics, because oftentimes it can just be websites or electronics in lots of people's minds. But I'd, I'd really like to make sure that it's bigger than that. Um, then we're going to talk a little bit about user experience. And then towards the end, we'll sort of encourage designing an interface. And some of you may have been working on that the past couple of days if you were really building an app. Which is, which is interesting. And I'm looking forward to hearing about what was made over the last week, because was, there was a lot. We tackled a lot last week talking about servers and backends and, and apps and all those sorts of things. So what are we even talking about for user interface? The interface is essentially how any user controls or interacts with your device. And we've seen specifically a lot of command line interface, CLI, and graphic user interface, GUI or GUIs. So GUIs and command line, those are interfaces that you can have, but there are many, many ways to invoke a GUI or to interface with things that aren't graphical, that are, that are more physical. And so we're gonna try and take a look at understanding those. And at any point, if you have good ideas, explorations, thoughts, questions, please feel free to stop and interject. This is a good one to have more as a discussion than as like an expository. So please feel free to chime in. But basically, I think that this is a topic that's best explored by really looking at examples and sort of debating how they work as interfaces. And so on the next slide, I've just got a whole bunch of them that are queued up for us to take a look at. And so let's see. These, these are some of the things that jumped to mind when I was trying to imagine like, what is the broadest range of interfaces that I can conceive of right now? Um, and so we start off in the kitchen in the top left or on the left side. You know, the fridge has got a pretty simple interface. I want inside fridge, grab handle, open door. That feels maybe a little Neanderthalish, but it's totally what it's, what it's there for. The interface on the stove, um, lots of people have strong opinions about those, whether they should be across the bottom at like hand height or whether you should have to reach over the hot piece to get to them because kids won't accidentally bump them there. There's a lot of strong opinions about where you put the interface on something that we don't even think that much about as a piece of technology, just the stove. Even though it totally is, it's much more advanced than cooking over a fire, for sure. Um, then a microwave has its own interface with a whole bunch of beep, beep, boop buttons, right? Where you click the things and then the little numerical display at the top shows you how long it's gonna go. There's blenders. Uh, I like these two blenders that are here. The one on the left has just some big fancy looking dial, but definitely smacks of some designer got a hold of this machine and said, this is what it's going to look like. They drew a sketch and then said, here, build it. And then the one on the right, that's a little bit more structural utilitarian. And then the buttons were, were pretty clearly the second thought 
in how you build it. Then there's like the Instapot and then you've got the other, you know, food processor, all those things that are a little bit more utilitarian in a kitchen. Uh, but it, but like the little girl with the modeled plastic kitchen has a lot of things to say about our society. One, I could not find a picture of a little boy in the same role, which is its own whole thing. Uh, but the, the fact that we make molded plastic of these interfaces that people use to make food and we let, we give them to kids to play with speaks to their importance. We're like helping kids practice these interfaces before they're even really aware of what they do beyond like, that's where the macaroni and cheese comes from. Uh, so it's fascinating to think that these have, how like deeply interfaces on every level have gotten into our, our world. Now, most of what we do to interface with a computer is the keyboard in the bottom left, keyboard and mouse, but there's many different invocations of that. There's the trackpad, um, which love them or hate them, that you could have to interface. I've got a vertical standing mouse at home actually, because it, your bones and your forearm aren't as crossed, carpal tunnel things. Uh, I've used trackballs before. People have strong opinions about all those. But then there's the more like, I don't often think of these as interfaces, things off to the right. Like a saxophone has got those finger buttons across the whole body. Like the holes are pretty much set because they have to be where they need to be for the instrument to function and make sounds. But then someone had to decide where those little levers and, and uh, fulcrums go so that you can get control over the saxophone, what would be the best place to put that? Same thing for the flute uh, down across the bottom. Someone had to design those mechanisms in so that when you hold it, it does what you want it to do in a way that's reasonable. Up in the top right, the same for a piano. You know, the, the, the piano makes it sound by mallets hitting strings inside the piano. And all those keys were laid out in a really long straight method. Maybe that was just because you could cut rectangles pretty easily back when the piano was invented. Maybe now it would make more sense to do like the, I'm thinking maybe like the Ursula pipe organ where the piano keys wrap around you and you've got like a more ergonomic reach to all the keys. Uh, and then cars, right? Cars and motorcycles, those have their own whole interface with dials and, and buttons and things to do. You know, there's all sorts of different pieces that, that get in the way there. If you play any video games, those two video game controllers should feel very familiar, PlayStation and Xbox. The Nintendo Switch has its same sort of deal. They all look pretty much identical. There's all, I mean, there's branding differences between them, but that's basically it. Uh, you've got four buttons on the right, four buttons on the left, two joysticks, one for each thumb, and then all of them now have trigger, trigger finger buttons on the bottom. Uh, maybe doubles of those. But beyond that, like they're basically the same. They fit well in the hand, they connect, but you have games that go all the way from like Animal Crossing where you're just sort of like picking fruit and selling it to, to little raccoons or you, like Doom where you're, you're fighting monsters and demons in hell. Like there's the whole range of things that these few inputs can control. Then you've got other inputs and interfaces like a pen is real, like does a pen have an interface? I don't know. How about buttons and zippers? That feels like an interface in some way to control a shirt or pants. Uh, light switches, the, the obvious interface of the, the one that is probably gonna be the highest paying interface design right now is user interface. So tablet, laptop, and phone. Those are, that's an image for responsive web design that the interface should look consistent platform to platform. That's a big deal right now in the tech world that you should have a consistent experience no matter where it's going and that you should probably be designing it for the phone first since that's likely where most of your users live uh, and then sort of work your way towards bigger screens afterwards. And then light switches, right? The traditional user interface, I, it, I like can't even wrap my head around what it must have been like to live in a world where this is the first light switch I've ever seen. And I don't quite know how to turn the lights on in a room. Like I, I can't wrap my head around that in any meaningful way. Like conceptually I can, but that's an, an important interface that most of us just flip on and off without any thought at all. All of those, and, and then e-stops are really important, especially at Make Haven. And doorknobs, you know, to get the doors to open and close, locks. It's, it's a little weird to think about all these as interfaces, but as we're moving forward, I wanna consider these pieces as interfaces. Some of them are very digital, some of them are very physical, and then there's things that are in between. 
So just trying to make sense of that. Let's first talk about hardware only. Like how do you control something in a way that's just hardware? So I've got a list on the left. That what I'm gonna often do for these slides is just have a list of things that in my mind, and we could totally argue them out as much as you want. Um, but those are all things that I figured their interface is definitely made to be hardware. It's not really intended to have any digital component per se, uh, but that it, it's enough there. And, and to sort of conceptualize a hardware control, for me, these are things that usually just cause a desired action to happen. Like if I flip the switch, the light turns on. Or if I strum the string on the guitar, the sound comes out, right? Those sorts of very physical things where immediately there's a response or shortly thereafter. Usually these are so obvious, they may not even need labels, but sometimes, you know, with little dials down here, in the bottom right, you'd have like a volume label. Uh, I can't, let's see, what your balance, sort of like where, your right left balance, your bass treble, those volume, you might need like a word or two to be able to think about how does that work. But usually a hardware control is something that's pretty simple and straightforward. And that has some real strengths, right? It can be the, the simplest thing to implement, right? If you're building a guitar, you don't need to put any, any you don't need to put in any extra effort to make an interface to control the strings, as opposed to like a piano where someone really did. Someone had to think, okay, I want these strings to make sound inside this big wooden box. And so then they had to go to a lot of effort to get a key press, a very light key press to turn into a mallet hitting a string. So there's various levels of hardware only controls, but it really can span quite a bit. And it may be in service of something digital, right? A button or a switch or those sorts of things. Those can totally be hardware controls, but there's no like digital components. It's not like a, an on-screen button. Hardware only controls, usually I'm trying to think about as that. And really, if I were to step back and, set, and think about the moments in life where I've implemented a hardware control, they're really great because they're so straightforward and people love to push buttons uh, is, is really genuinely true. But one of the things that, the thing that makes them great is that they're so easy to tell people what they are, but they usually only have one job, typically. Most of the time a button, it, increasingly we're starting to wrap our heads around if you short press it or if you long press it, you get different actions. Cell phones have taught us that. Uh, but most of the time, it's usually true that if you have a button, it only does one thing. The like most famous exception of that is the iPhone's button. But people really like, and we're, we're going to talk a little bit more about the iPhone button that existed for a long time and has since disappeared. Uh, but people really like pushing buttons is, is maybe the core of this. Now, you can also get feedback from hardware. And so if you're talking about interface, it's really more like your conversation with the device. So controlling is one part of an interface, but then getting feedback back from the thing is another part of interfacing. And so in this case, I wanna be a little bit more careful about how it's defined. Usually if you're talking about feedback, I'm gonna categorize that for the, the sake of discussion as providing information back to the user, whether the information is directly the output of the device. So like a thermometer is actually gonna be a good example of giving you information directly back or whether it's to control it. And so just as an example, down here on the left, this is a little car that some of my students built at the last high school where I taught. They were in a competition where they had to build a car that could drive a certain distance and stop on a target. And so it was a, it's a tricky game, uh, but what we ended up doing was we put these little encoders here that would measure, it's just a quadrature encoder. And so if you built the, thing, it measures how much it turns. And we put those right onto the wheels so they could measure how much they had turned. And since we knew the circumference of the wheel, we, if we could follow that and the wheels didn't slip, we knew exactly how far the car had driven so we could stop right when we were at the point. And actually the kids realized that the momentum of the car was a problem. So they'd overshoot and then back up until they got to the exact point where they wanted to stop, which was fascinating to watch. But in the competition, they didn't know exactly where they were gonna stop. So they built this little interface with a series of LEDs they'd press this button here and the LEDs would light up in certain color combinations. It was counting up in binary and they had like 31 possible positions where they could make the car stop. 
And so that's just a very little interface where they click the one button and the, the LEDs would light up and they knew like, okay, I need it to go 12 and a half meters. So I need these string of buttons, these string of LEDs to be lit up and they could just press the button until they got there. It's a really simple feedback system, but it was a quick way to on the fly program the car to say, I want you to go this distance and I have less than a minute to tell you that. So they could press the button 15 times and make it go exactly where they wanted it to go, but they needed some feedback to make sure they didn't overshoot on those button presses. This sort of an interface is actually a really nice way to get feedback. And if you've ever worked in a professional kitchen, I think back to my days working at McDonald's, all the weird like little, just one light here, or like a little tiny interface that would tell you that something's done or it's ready, like just barely enough of an interface to make the thing operate is sometimes what you get in industrial kitchens, a lot different than a, a home kitchen where it might tell you what it's doing. Hardware interfaces like this can be really helpful, but there's also very mechanical ones like the bubble level is a great um, example of a feedback system because it tells you right, right then and there is the thing level. There's some assumptions in between that the, the bubble level is, is square or parallel to the side of the thing, but you know, it's, it's giving you information. Or like analog voltmeters where there's a dial that, that sweeps back and forth. That's directly giving you information. That's feedback with information as the output of the device for a voltmeter. Or like a pressure gauge or, or thermometers, those sorts of things like odometer rolling number gauges, those are all giving you information directly as the feedback is the output of the device. It's an interesting use case to think about and to build your own measuring tools. But there are, there are moments where building a measuring tool is, is absolutely useful and probably worth it. Um, but you can think about how those, how those work. These are also, I would put these in the relatively straightforward to implement. I mean, not all of them. You can build your own rolling odometer numbers and that is not a simple mechanism. But once a lot, for a lot of these, they're pretty straightforward to implement and they can be not terribly complicated to code also. But sometimes it takes just a little bit of training. Depending on how complex this hardware feedback gets, you can start to really wish that you had a screen instead, right? Like if we could have jammed a screen onto that little car, it might've been easier to say, it's about to try and drive 12 meters. Would have been easier to give that full sentence of feedback, right? This was much faster for the kids to solder together. So it, it's an interesting thing, right? To think about how do you want hardware to be your feedback and it's maybe sort of ambiguously on the border for these LEDs. The kids actually liked this so much that they wanted to double down on it. So this is a shift register and a whole bunch of LEDs in a row. They had to fit more different stopping points in their rooms of the car. A little laser sight and steering. This the following year they had to steer, which is why it has the thing on the right. Uh, it really got intense, that competition. But how do you, so that was hardware, hardware for controls and hardware for feedback. Now talking about software. Software controls, uh, mostly here I'm thinking about on-screen buttons or like on-screen forms, things, this is definitely what feels like how you control a website. And so good examples of this are all of your experiences with social apps, online banking, like phone games, maybe console or computer video games sort of are in the blended camp. But anything where really it's like your finger and that's about it for all you need for control. Designing so that your website can be navigated by finger is pretty tricky. Um, implementing this can be hard, harder, uh, but it's got a really important flexibility point in that if it's a software button, you can change what buttons are on display at any moment. You can make them contextual. So if I'm in one part of a menu, these buttons show. If I'm in another part of a menu, these other buttons show. So like in, Fusion 360 is a good example. If you're in the sketching area, you get the sketching tools. If you're in the modeling area, you get the modeling tools. You go to the cam section, you see cam buttons, right? All of those are contextually located. And so it's definitely a platform that people really use. We've known this for a long time. The pictures across the bottom, I, ki I kind of love. Like on the right, that's an all physical switchboard option for getting people connected to phone calls. And if you think back to like, what the world must have been like running one of those uh, where you're a switchboard operator and you're connecting families to families for phone calls. That's an all hardware option for solutions. And not that much later or almost at the same time, 
You've got Star Trek where there's a wall of screens, a circle of screens across the bridge. And the idea that one day your controls are gonna fit into a much more compacted area because you've got these screens available to you. And then like bringing that all the way into now with a cell phone. Like the amount of processing in a cell phone is way more than what we used to get to the moon the first time. The, the amount of processing and control that we can cram into a little screen that can adaptively feel your finger change on the fly and do all sorts of things, it can, it can get you anywhere from uh, finding dinner to finding a date, right? Like all of those are available with the phone because we can change what buttons are on screen and what services it's connected to, which is incredible. Um, there's a whole range of buttons. They can look like all sorts of things. This is certainly a huge space to think about in, in a deeper way. And if you're building websites, this is definitely something to explore on a really fundamental level. What do you want to have? A lot of the time we still see buttons for controls on the web because people get what buttons are. Like a light switch is a, an innate part of how we operate in the modern world and not having light switches or switches of some kind it would, feel, would feel strange. Um, I, I honestly like when I'm at a friend's house who doesn't have or use their light switches because they're fully loaded with smart bulbs, I will have to pause and ask them like, how do I turn on the light in the, in this other room? Or you'll notice that those friends almost never put a smart bulb in their bathroom because they don't want to have to go through that experience of explaining to you how to turn on the light in the bathroom, right? It's a really interesting problem. Uh, for them, it might be more convenient because they, they just like walk through the house and everything turns on and off, but they don't want to go through that little awkward exchange of putting, telling someone how to use their bathroom, which is interesting um, for controlling things. So it's, it's just a fascinating space to think about as we're trying to explore these ideas. Now, how do you get feedback from software? And this is another one where really like, this is where you're trying to give information back. And so here's, here's like information dashboards across the bottom. So if this is what you do for work, um, this, is, this is where UI, UX designers, including the buttons, and I should have probably included them there, but like a professional web UI, UX developer designer is going to live sort of in this software only feedback space and software only control space. There's definitely far more dynamic to that career than I can give any service to reasonably at all. Um, but it's good to know that, that that's one of the main camps that this exists in. And, and as makers, we go beyond just websites, right? Like down there in the bottom right, I have a little device. This is a heater that I built and that's a tiny little OLED screen circled in purple. So in there, I could output the temperature of that thing. That particular device is still in Ohio, otherwise I'd bring it. Um, but it would output the temperature and like how much time is left until it's done cooking. Right, so just a few pieces of information, but that, that I would say is software because it's output on a screen and it's sort of an arbitrary dividing line between that and an LED, but just a little bit of extra text really makes it much easier to deal with some of these controls or like a, a digital wristwatch versus an analog wristwatch, right? You're getting digital information through a screen. The watch screens, like my, my watch is one of the old school kinds. It's the only one I haven't electrocuted in a couple of years. So it's good, to, it's good to have those. But in these systems, you have almost dedicated screens. These have to be custom designed to the watch that you're using. And then the circuit has to be built around getting that particular LCD to work. Um, and then smartwatches even, even more so, right? Like there's a little full screen that needed way more computing power to make that happen. Smartwatches like this came around in the late 80s. Uh, and then, or, you know, digital watches and then smart watches were late 2010s, right? That, that was a much later development because you need far more processing power and battery density to get that to happen. So there's a lot of different interesting things in this software feedback space that are worth exploring. Um, some that are really cool, if you're looking for just trying to expand into this realm, I bought an e-ink screen and those are fascinating. Like the Kindle e-readers, because they only require power when they're changing their state. So if you haven't ever been able to read on the e-reader, the battery lasts for months because it only needs battery power when it's changing the page, not when it's showing the page. So you can get e-reader displays. You can like buy them on Adafruit or other suppliers. 
and then put them onto devices and they can hold their state for however long, even when it's unplugged, which is really cool. Uh, they're starting to have them in multiple colors. Like you can, one color is cheapest, but two or three colors do exist. So those are fun platforms to have. There's tons of different options. A 16 by two LCD screen is probably pretty easy to get your hand on and they interface with Arduino really nicely. So if you wanted to put something like that from more text-based feedback uh, on a project, you totally can. But those I'd say are software because it's, it's definitely a display. It can write words at you. And in my mind, now you have to wonder like, what are the best words to say? Like, what do I wanna give numbers? Do I wanna say that this is the temperature or can I get away with just a degree and an F symbol? And then I know that it's degrees Fahrenheit or degrees Celsius if you wanna, if you wanna do that. So all of those are interesting things that really are software feedback systems. And so there's tons of, because you have such control, especially when you have a full open screen to do things, it's really important to put all of that information out front. And, and like, well, we're gonna look at blended right now and it's, it's worth it to just pause and do this. But blended interfaces don't isolate those two. Probably the isolation that we just did of feedback and control and software and hardware is, is pretty arbitrary of a decision point, but sometimes it's good for, just to have those words as, as separations. Uh, oh, there's some good Dexter's lab. Oh, I totally missed comments. I should go back to this. Um, yeah, Google is moving to a mobile first indexing system is totally right, which is, which is worth mentioning for software only feedback and control. Google, is ranking websites for like how they show up in, in search results. And if you're mobile first, you go higher in the results than if you aren't. So it's really important for websites to do mobile first as a, as a standard. They also do it based on your load times. So how quickly does your web page load and a few other things. So people are really fighting aggressively to make that happen. Uh, ooh, keyboard key reactivity. Keyboards are really a good way to nerd out about this. Some people, well, in this blended world, right? If we're going to blended, you can talk about a keyboard in here. A keyboard would definitely, I'd say, count as a blended sort of interface. You're typing words and letters. Um, and there are people who are very strongly opinionated about their keyboards. I am, I can tell a bad one, but I, I, don't, I don't have a refined palette for what, what's the best feel of keys. Um, but it's certainly a blended piece. Some people have no qualms, they'll type on whatever's there. It, it's, that one is, I think, more a passion project than really a UI, UX thing. Uh, and how much cash do you have to burn into a keyboard is another big question for your keyboard experience. Let's see. Um, oh, keyboards that look like the ocean wave. I totally had one of those for a little while. It was good for a time. I, I'm glad I'm done with it now. There's lots of keyboard emotions for sure. Uh, let's see what other questions there's some other there's a link that Aaron sent in we'll have to see what that is at some point but here are complex and blended interfaces I would put all video game consoles in this complex blended interface there's some dedicated hardware on them and then there's the because the controller is the controller like I'm thinking about Ocarina of Time on N64 the buttons on most Nintendo 64 games, the buttons were clearly yellow, green, and blue right there on screen while you're playing the game. Like they would cover them, they'd have them on screen, and then they'd put some logo on top of them. They were, the controls were a fixed part of the system and they wanted you to know their branding was there and they wanted you to know what the button would do for you at that time, right? So it, there's definitely some struggle to getting this controller system to work with games of any variety and make that happen. There's certainly some artistry to get that to work. Arcade games, essentially, like if you wanna build an arcade machine right now, you can buy for like $40, the same dedicated buttons that went across all of those machines. And basically the difference is the, the branding that went onto those wooden boxes. But if you look at them, they're pretty much all a TV in a box with at basically arm height, a set of controls that's a joystick and six buttons. And that's pretty much it. Like there's not a ton of difference, uh, but you can get a lot in that little interface system, right? That there were some that broke that mold, uh, but when you step back and think about it, less about a game and more about like what, what physically is it, 
a lot of it is branding beyond just the interface itself. Now there's, I mean, but you can go way beyond it, right? There's interfaces, we would say in the bottom left, that's totally a website. And the bottom right, that's completely a GPS. But with the device abstracted away, either of them could show up on the phone, or maybe the one on the right is only on a Garmin and the one on the left is only gonna work on a laptop that way. Right, it's, it's a little trickier. And, and there's some deliberate effort put in to make sure that for you, the experience is consistent platform to platform. That for you, the user, you don't have to relearn the skill of how do I read this map? What do I do? You're in the moment of driving, traffic is hectic. You don't, they don't want you to have to be worried about like interpreting what's on screen so that you know what to do next. Someone put a lot of effort into making sure that the graphic and the text were nice and clear, the contrast was high enough, and that you know exactly what you need to do. All of those things are really important. Um, the keyboard and computer interface, I think, is one of those user experience pieces that's really important. The one, the one thing that I am particularly persnickety about with a computer is the quality of the screen. To me, that matters a lot. Uh, I want it to have pixels that are so small that I can't see them. If I can, if I can make that happen, uh, that's not true for my laptop. But and so I'm fine if it doesn't happen. But those sorts of experience things can be really important. But the, the main one for a web designer, and Apple has known that for a long time, the retina displays were a big deal even when Windows laptops weren't hitting that benchmark across the board. Um, but that's part of why they charge a premium. In here, you've got the window, the, the desktop and mobile versions of websites, those sorts of blended interfaces where it's hardware, uh, agnostic, right? It doesn't really matter you're, if you're playing with Instagram, whether it's on a phone or whether it's on a desktop, it should feel very familiar. There's lots of effort put into those shared experiences. And all of the social media apps just nail it on these. They have huge development teams. Facebook rolls out new features to different user groups at a time. They focus test them instead of making it one large. It used to be that they'd roll out big features all in one shot. And now they'll say like, okay, this feature is gonna go to this 100 million people this new feature is going to go to this 100 million people and we'll see who engages with it more to find out which version of the feature we like better and then we'll do that one for everybody right there's a whole bunch of testing that happens like that dynamically from these social media platforms so they can get the most user engagement possible um and social media is a lot of fun it's also don't forget and i this is because i teach high schoolers it's a casino in your pocket don't ever forget that um the the interface across the bottom, you know, there's the Tesla on the right. Yeah, you are the product is definitely an interesting way to think about that. There's, there's yep, mm -hmm. for social media. The Tesla is an interesting vehicle. If you've ever been able to sit in one, sometimes I float into those, into those showrooms and just imagine, pretend like I uh, belong there and then sit down in the driver's seat to those and look at the steering wheel and the screen and imagine like somebody must have really thought about like if we could totally reimagine the car, what do we want to do? And I think in order to make it tech savvy, they said, well, we just want to put the biggest screen in we can possibly do, right? J just so that it feels like the future. That's what for a long time movies have been showing us cars are going to have TVs in them. And so they basically have started to do that at that, at that size of the screen. It's different from you know, the Chevy screen is, is not huge on like a, I've got a Malibu. And so it's not a giant screen. It's just enough to get you a GPS and maybe a little bit more. Um, but there's all sorts of those interfaces that you play with across apps and across, there's a, a digital to analog converter. This might have some app that interfaces with it on a computer to control it by hardware or by software. And to get those to feedback to each other can be really valuable. But these complex and blended interfaces, this is where this is like where the money gets made. When you're mastering this sort of a level of interface, this is where really high level things happen and people have strong opinions about what these look like. Professional designers do this basically, whether it's a blended interface that's completely a website or that it's device agnostic, uh, mobile first, but it doesn't really matter that much. This is where you've got all sorts of things. And so just down the left is a list, but that's really a list of terms from a website that I found that was all about user interface things. 
uh, for user experience, user experience designer, customer experience, th those sorts of things. The big ones for me are like the five second test. Can a person in five seconds understand what your website's about? Because that's important. The three click rule, it shouldn't take more than three clicks to do anything important on a website. The that white space is, which may feel like wasted space for any designer and those of you who are the more artsy among us will absolutely know that the negative space of a page is perhaps just as important as the positive space, the stuff that is actually there and the stuff that the space around it can be really important. If you want to make something bold and, and central, usually you have to have some sort of a way to offset it with some white space, some blank areas. And then sketching and wireframes and mockups and prototypes, those are all really important ways to build out sort of the structure of what you want to be and test it without going to the effort of building out a whole website. It gives you a target to design for. So it's really important. Um, part of the blended control that really is worth noting is the iconic iPhone button, right? The button on the bottom of an iPhone, since the whole thing was a touch screen, really didn't need to be there for a long time, probably since it started. But people just like a button. It was one of the things that Steve Jobs was famously uh, cranky about was the user interface and the experience. He loved the roller wheel on the old iPods. He, you know, there were different pieces that were really important that they would nail. Uh, famously, there's a story of him yelling at an engineer during the first demo for the iPod because there wasn't enough of a satisfying click when you click in the headphone jack, which no one would have seen at the technical demonstration. Uh, but it's, it's an interesting thing to, to have really set expectations for people about what these devices work and feel like. If you want to take an idea that you have into a full product realm, you're going to have to struggle with these ideas. And there's lots of moments where a business will, will be working to get you to help them get the perfect experience for their users. And, and we certainly started to see it extend, extend all the way into the unboxing event at the start of owning anything. Right, that that is a part, there's, I mean, you can watch hours of unboxing videos on YouTube. And most of the time, YouTubers will just, it's obligatory that they include that part if they have something that they're reviewing, which is kind of weird. I don't actually really care that much about the packaging. I care if the 3D printer works, not what it came in. Uh, those are, which is, which is fascinating. Um, and so really, the one, the one key thing about all of these is that we haven't talked about how do you code or how do you do any of that. This is far more a thing about people and how, how are you communicating with them in this nonverbal way uh, to try and explain what your web, website or your product or your project or your art piece or your instrument is about. How do you explain that to them in a way that's nonverbal? And that sort of terminology, that sort of talking to them is really important and it's more about that human interaction than it is about the tech itself. Whoops. And so as, as we talk about all of these things, including color and design and all of that, the usability is all about the people and how they use things. It's not about technology. And I, I did not, so, okay, so just to be clear, this slides is color and design. There's nothing that follows it because there is far more theory to color and design than I can even possibly try and encompass. And there's many of you who are artists that will know this is true. Like there's whole color palettes that you can go into. Uh, there's, and, and we can look at color palettizers and all sorts of things where you have complementary and contrasting colors. That would be its own whole degree series into color theory and how you make these interfaces work. I would love to hear thoughts later or, or right now from anybody who knows, like if I wanna build a healthy foods uh, website, what color should it be? Should it be green? Should it be brown? Should it be bright blue, right? If I wanna build a healthy food app, I probably don't want it to be glaringly purple. But, but you know, that's, that's the Planet Fitness color scheme, yellow and purple, but it's probably not what I want my fancy grocery stores website to look like. There's all sorts of theory that exists out there about what colors go with what sort of industries and how do you make that work? How do you make your design look trendy or established? How do you, what sort of communication do you have? And to try and explain that here with, with just a few words is gonna be something that honestly, I, I am at a loss to be able to do. But, there, but I'd love to hear when we get to the show and tell like what is a great example of design uh, from each of you, like what's a website 
or uh, institution that you you think their visual personality is on point so that we could go explore it? And then what does it say to you by looking at their branding or their or their look? Um, I'd love to hear more about that from you all. Anna's got, ooh, Anna's got a, a feedback. When she designed her logo for the business and website, she had to think about these things a lot for the for the gift wrapping business, right? Those sorts of pieces really can make or break it, right? When someone goes to your website and you have, according to this, five seconds to win them over, you've got to nail it for the first impression. It's It feels superficial. And if you've got something that's so incredibly useful that the user interface doesn't really matter, then people will use it, right? Like MySpace was a great example of that. The interface was pretty bad. <laughs> Uh, it, it wasn't pretty, it didn't look elegant, but people really used it to socially connect. And it was so obviously clear from MySpace that social media was going to take off, right? And so then it feels perhaps obvious that Facebook followed right after. And then we've gotten this flood of social apps because people just fundamentally need to have this feeling of being connected, even though you know research bears out that probably social media is going helping us go in the other direction uh yeah glitch is a great one there's and so we'll pull up some let's let's take a look at glitch let's see if i can get this to open in the right spot there we go here's glitch this is a coding website and if you think about the dark um slightly scariness of vs code here's glitch and here are some projects that that i have spun up oh this is connected to my account already Let's see, where's my cursor even at? There we go. We'll just go to the main page, manage teams, help center. Uh, if we go to these different pages, like look at that, how fun and friendly that help center is. Need help, we've got you. And then they follow it up with lots of big pictures and cards, these ways to identify and cover, go over things. They want you to feel like, oh, this is a fun and friendly space. I think, right? I think the other thing too about it that really blows my mind is all the words are simple. Like yeah. there's no like tech jargon at all. Like it's, yeah, I think that yeah, that says I mean, a lot. Look at this one. What? Why is my project not running? <laughs> right? <laughs> like, that is, will glitch clean up my code formatting. Those are very non-technical terms, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and so they do a great job of hitting that mark spot on. Those sorts of pieces, like that is good branding that makes them, I'm sure that they get users strictly because of that, because it's just it, I would say the website looks friendly, right? It's a fun color palette. The curves are nice and soft um, and the, the speech is relatively straightforward. It's why um, I have recommended for years that my mother try a Mac because Mac for a long time was really good at all their error messages were very plain spoken as opposed to win Windows, which will send up a blue screen of death and like, you have no, like, it's just coded text. You don't know what it is. It's unclear. Windows has gotten better at that over the past decade, um, but it was definitely a strength that Apple had over Windows for a long time. I, I posted a link for, as a perfect example of, of, I think, what Glitch does. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, look at this. Hello, friends. Hello, world. You know, they've got, this is right here. So this is taking all the trickiness of live server away. It's just doing it. Here's your file explorer. There's your text and there's that. You don't have to worry about much of the detail. And this is like, you click and basically it does this for you, right, Aaron? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, like they've removed as many barriers as they can. They hit that free click rule with coding, which is not an easy place to hit it. Um, totally worth it to explore a little further. So branding like that is really valuable to look at and consider. Ooh, I should come back to this. Is that okay? And so nailing it on those blend interfaces is really essential. Hitting the coloring uh, in the right spot is going to be different. If we, you know, take that color scheme versus if we, uh, I want to do, let's see, Fortnite. Not that I'm a big Fortnite fan, but if we pull up this website for Fortnite free to play Windows PC. You know, here's here's their website. I mean, this is a run around shoot 'em up game, but it's it looks 
fun and playful, right? This looks like toys for little children because it is. Uh, they nail it on the branding there. There's, and then there's um, half life game. You know, just rolling through different versions of games. This one is going to be creepier looking, right? It's it's got rusted systems. It looks older uh, by age, but it's got a whole different branding system. And then there's, you know, Steam has got its own whole thing on top of it to try and push that at you. But there's there's lots of different variations versus like if we pull up brands for different things, Animal Crossing, I don't know why I'm on a video game kick here, but this is what we're doing, Animal Crossing. You pull up Animal Crossing images and you're gonna get all sorts of lovely, like cutesy little animals that are fun to play with and look, look like this would be a great time. They'd be a good stuffed animal to have on the shelf. I think they just started a collaboration somewhere to make the stuffed animal breeds. But like, this is totally a branding game and your interface, the color design that communicates things and it needs to not be underestimated, the power of that. I just wanna you know, keep reiterating that. And many of you know that, uh, but it's really essential as you think about your designs. So the user experience, the, if we talked about interface before, that's how you control it. The experience is sort of what we've wandered towards in this little meandering talk. And so the user experience goes from unboxing to craft, and it's the life cycle of all of that. The first thing that I would encourage you to think about for your own made projects is who is going to use your creation. Is it for the little kids at the bottom of there? Is it for like an intense nerdy squad up at the top? Uh, maybe professionals or mass markets, like you can see across the middle. Those, those groups are gonna decide a lot of what your, your thing is built for. Maybe you're the only user ever, and then you don't have to worry about much of anything other than can you control it? That's it, period, the end. Uh, is it for lots of people? What, how much safety do you need? This, this robot from Maker Faire in like San Francisco, I think it breathes fire. So, you know, what safety mark do you need to hit for those sorts of things versus this little guy who's thinking as hard as he can uh, and is real cute um, is, what's the the safety threshold for him is very different than the flamethrower so you've got all of those different pieces that you need to take into account and how robust you need it to be like a book for a little kid has to have those hard pages so they don't tear them out but there's lots of expectations and this is probably one of the more nuanced pieces that's worth it for us to talk about for makers is that your project pretty much is not going to exist in a void if you build a chair or you bake a loaf of bread people will have other ideas of what those things are for comparison's sake, right? If you bake a roll or a baguette, people are gonna draw comparisons to Wonder Bread, right? And at some point, Wonder Bread, I'm sure was someone's favorite. Uh, so for those, there, there are many versions. It's really, really a rare thing that you make something that's completely and totally new. It happens, it must happen from time to time. Someone built the first car. Someone put together the first website, the first social media platform was something. I don't even know if it was MySpace, but something existed first. And so some, someone put that together, but it's very rare that that happens. Most of the time people will say, oh, it's this app is the new TikTok. This is the, you know, they'll compare it from one app to another or from one thing to another. Uh, planes are the new trains, but they're in the sky, right? Oh, the, the horseless carriage, right? Those sorts of things, those comparisons are going to be something that's really hard to avoid. And if you're trying to build and produce a product, you're gonna to have to think about where do you fit in that comparison game and what pieces are important for you. And a lot of the ways that businesses get around this or that projects get around is by having a niche, right? An artisan bakery versus trying to do mass market bread, uh, local pub, the one that's around the corner, handmade sweaters, family recipes, being something that has sort of a, a smaller subset that it's even attempting to go after. But for me, and I think for lots of us who are in this game, who are in foundation, I, I've got this, this is my thought, that making things is way often more about your personal skill and originality. I think that when you've made something, it's really your personality made manifest in a physical thing, that it's sort of an embodiment of you, your efforts, your skills, and it's, it's that put into the world. It's sort of like you creating a thing uh, that takes it from an idea you have into a reality that exists that you can share with others. 
And then beyond that, it may be something that if it's, if it's not just a physical thing, maybe it's a new idea or a new way to start to think about things that lets you improve the way you think, it helps augment how you work or it helps other people come to light. I can think about some great pieces of art that really changed how people thought about things. They, they got us to look at things in a new perspective, right? If you think about surrealism and how, even though those are weird, weird paintings, it got people to really question some things about the world uh, and, and how they fit together. Great projects that you make, great art. Those pieces I find is inspiring because they build out the personality of a person. And they also give you new ideas that can help change minds, right? If you, if you name some of the more recent, very popular artists, Picasso, uh, Frida Kahlo, Salvador Dali, they made major changes in the art world and their work got people talking about things, right? Those, those characters definitely had some impact and, and they weren't necessarily trying to be the most profitable at any given moment. It's, a, it's fascinating and it's really an interesting space to live. Okay, so, you know, hard turn. Maybe I should have ended with that one, uh, but rugged design. This is something that's definitely worth thinking about. Don't put breadboards in your finished product. You want to have something that's sturdy enough that it will last if you want it to last for a very long time. So moving from a breadboard to a circuit board can be helpful. Here's three different versions of ruggedness in cameras. The one in the top was all that was available at the time. You know, the, the hardware mechanisms for building a, an all hard lens and focusing it would have been hard. So the, the like paper or leathery paper stuff that they used was possible. But then you've got the Nikon D90 and the GoPro, right? Those, those are two cameras, both can shoot in 4K, uh, but there's lots of differences between them and sort of what do you want, how rugged do you need it to be is something that's interesting. But it's also when you're designing your projects, you can think about making it as rugged as you possibly can or leaving it very delicate. You definitely wanna at the very least think about it. How long do you want this project to last? Is it something for forever? Or is it something that you just wanna have happen for a short time? Right now, I'm entertaining the idea of building a side table that I want to be in one configuration while it's next to a bed that's on risers. And then once it's no longer next to a bed on risers, I wanna shrink the side table back down to be a normal side table. It's, so thinking about the life cycle of a project is an important part of it. And for businesses, that often means they're planning for planned obsolescence, which is its own whole internet wormhole you should dive down if you want to. Like the iPhone was curvy and then it went square. And how much do you want to guess the next one's going to be curvy and rounded again, right? There's some piece to that design cycle or that new fashion every, uh, every season, there's a whole new fashion to go after. I am reminded every year by my high schoolers that I am not a slave to fashion <laughs> in any way um, because they keep getting uh, up-to-date fashionable clothes and I do not. And I'm completely fine with that. But it, it means that there's a life cycle for how those things work and how they move forward. And you'll wanna think about how rugged or robust does your design need to be. Some of the famous quotes, uh, one, the one on top, I couldn't figure out who to attribute it to. So I'm assuming it was Plato. Anybody can build a bridge, but it takes an engineer to build one that barely stands. To optimize your costs and strengths and durability, those are totally things that, that an engineer thinks about really intensely is how do we build the bridge so that it's strong enough, meets all the requirements, but we don't build it twice as good as it needs to be uh, because that would cost twice as much. Or better is the enemy of good is one that I have heard many dads in many states say to their, to their kids working on projects. So it's definitely, uh, and not just dads, but that's the uh, people that I have seen, actually seen saying that to people. Uh, there's lots of different interesting things to take a look at, some lots of different interesting pieces to explore. Let's see, we've got images.jpg. What is, what is this? I got something coming up from Anna. I need to probably stop sharing to download it. But uh, this rugged design is something to think about as you're exploring ideas. And so just circling back, we've talked about interface and how that can go in hardware only and software only how you blend those color and design as a valuable uh, essential piece of how these are all put together. Then the user experience that sort of goes to the target audiences, user expectations, safety uh, is, is definitely something to consider and ruggedness are all there. But then the real goal is to try and build 
some sort of an interface. And you're going to, whether you do it this week, which is probably not actually the moment to do it, or whether you do it when we get to machine design, uh, which is coming up in a couple of weeks, we're gonna have you building machines and teams. You're gonna have to think about how does a person interface with this machine? Is it gonna be a series of buttons, right? If, we, if you're on a team that builds an automated garden, how do you control the automated garden? Is it through a website? Is it through a series of like a button panel or it says water them now? Uh, what are you gonna put effort into making so that you can get feedback and control those devices? So it's definitely something to consider and think about to explore. This is definitely the topic that I find is best for me to have conversations with people about so that when I go through different versions of an interface, there's moments to reflect on it, to think about it, to, to play test. I built the robot bartender and have had a hand, and it feels like a million years ago, but have had parties where this, the express goal was to test that the machine would work over the course of a whole evening, pouring out several drinks for several different humans, and that without guidance from me, people could figure out how to run it, right? Those were two important metrics that I would be testing when I would have those sorts of endeavors. We can have another one of those once we're all vaccinated. But the, but the key is that you wanna be able to test your interfaces and see, do they work? Do they communicate what you wanna communicate? Do they let people control in a way that they need to? It's really an artful thing to do this. And I, and I think that's probably the core assertion is that this is an artful game more than it's a technical game. And you gotta keep that in mind, even if you're sort of throw, slapping it together in the last minute, there is some artistry that happens there. And so don't, don't, under, don't underplay it. Let's see. But that that's the end. That's the end of the slides, everybody. And I think we nailed it for time, uh, which is exciting. It's always happy when we do. And so now I have uh, lots of questions for show and tell. Like, what did you guys do this week? What were you up to? What are some good examples that you've seen in the world about interfaces? I think that that would be the main thing that I want to see, especially because a few of you were building apps this week. And so what was your interface like for an app? would be really fascinating to see explored because we didn't, we hadn't talked about this, but it's something that everyone just kind of understands because it's a part of the way that we've related to tech and things for so long. Corey, before we jump into, um, into show and tell, I'm not yeah. totally clear on like what I would do for this week. So for, and that's, re so the short answer for that is don't try and jump onto something. For example, Kate, I know that you built some apps and your, your apps were like click and drag apps. In my mind, that's an interface. There's, this is more of like an open week. It's probably kind of wild cardy. If you wanted to, I've got, uh, we can sort of sketch out an interface for things that you've been building. Like if this would be a good moment to imagine if we're gonna build, if you know that we wanna build a garden in the future, you know you'd like to hop in on that project, sort of imagine what you think that would be so that when it comes to be that week, you've sketched out what a website could look like or what a button panel could look like. Cause it could be really fun to have either of those and make it. So build an interface is either physically build one. There might be some of you that are at a point with a project like Ruby and her cloud might be physically building an interface or saying she doesn't need one at all. Uh, your app might be in a good spot. Aaron, you know, I'm imagining for each one of you, you're probably at a moment where an interface is worth circling back to and taking another moment to look at. Uh, and so to explore those ideas, it, this is more of a conceptual one. So it's, it's less, it's certainly less of a, ha, here's a thing to do. It's, it's not like the, here's follow this SSH rule. And I, for that, I apologize. A little ambiguity on this end is, is trickier, but hopefully we can, just use it as a moment to pause and think about like, how do you do an interface? A mock-up is a good way to go. So maybe maybe like a useful thing to say is pull up a system like Figma or Inkscape and design what you'd want a website to be. And then use that as a tool to sort of plan out what you want. There's there's not really a specific here do this though. Like here's the action. There's no specific make this thing. Does that make some sense? Okay. All right, so with, with that, there are several people on the call and I would like to hear from show or tell, show and tell what you did this week 
and like a great example of a app or website or something that really speaks to you about the culture or interface of it for like what, what it's all about. That gives you either warm fuzzies or creeped out feelings all, all in one shot. Oh, Kate, you found a little boy in a kitchen. Good, we can fight those gender stereotypes. That's great. Uh, so let's, let's see. There are all sorts. Okay, so anybody unmuted like to go first? Aaron, it looks like you're unmuted. Oh, whoops. <laughs> okay, yeah, um, mine should be pretty short. I, I guess I spend a lot of time in like a UI UX world when I'm designing things for work. Uh, but I guess in a way it's, it's kind of my comfort zone. So I'm actually trying to avoid it right now and stick with the coding side of things just to get a little bit deeper. But um, I think one of the things that I've become really cognizant of, perhaps more aware of is a lot of the tools that I take for granted that already make connections between things. Like when we were talking about APIs last week, uh, they can make it extremely easy to connect two things together with a few buttons. You know, you type in your, your authentication information, like a username and password, and it does the rest for you. So I think it's like, as I'm learning more about the back end of how they work, I'm having increasingly more uh, respect and appreciation for, for what people have built to make that more accessible. Uh, in terms of like what discrete things I've done, I spent a lot of time watching videos on JavaScript this uh, this last week. I probably I don't know watched like twelve to fifteen hours of videos at this point. Um, again, just like Rock and Ruby suggestion. Let's like I'm just like watching all the stuff before I'm trying to do all of it. So that way I'm like okay cool like I think. I know it's going to come next when I watch it next time. So I'm not like, oh, I, I can't go too far because I need to listen to what's going to come next. So I feel a little bit more confident. I've never done that before. So I'm trying to do it a different way. And it, it seems like it's working. So yeah. call it the Ruby method. That's good. That's a good method. Oh my god, I invented something. There you go. Um, I, OK, I guess I guess that means I'm next. Um, hi, everybody. Um, this week, I um, went on the MIT website and I followed some of the tutorials. Um, I didn't get around to making an app. That seems like a lot still, but I did do those baby tutorials and those baby tutorials are hard, but they're really fun. Um, they're, they're, they're not hard. Let me let me let me take that back They're fine they are approachable um but it's still not my world at all um but i feel really proud that i was at least able to make um what is it there's a kitty one when you when you click it like it meows i like that one there's um the bee it, it buzzes that was interesting and then i'm um halfway through the um whack-a-mole um it was it's a great time um and then besides that, I mean, it's not technically related to the class, but um, I, let me share my screen. Um, okay, not that. Um, I laser cut onto some jeans. That's really loud. And um, I used like the settings that me and Lila um, did way back um and it came out great but uh it turns out for me because the design was so much like i guess taking up a lot of like a, a lot of it was burned in um so it's actually quite um it's starting to starting to break down on my on my farmer jeans that i use for work so i kind of have to like use less power which is fine um and then <sighs> Um, I made some tufting uh, rug kits, and this was before I did. Um, I did two rows. I I like jammed it in there, so there's two rows of those um carpet tack things, um, and that was. I'm so proud of that. Um, and they stay up. They stand on their own. That's my first. Yeah, woodworking project that does that. So that was cool. Um, and that is 
all, I think. That's exciting. Because you're the, you and Lila are running the rug, the rug making class. That's coming up pretty I'm soon, right? Assistant, but yes. Yeah. Yeah. It'll be exciting. exciting. The class is like sold out, which is cool. Yeah. yeah it's on Saturday. It's this Saturday? Yeah. Yeah, that's exciting. With a waiting list, people who wanted us to do it again, which we will. Oh my yeah. God, that's so exciting. Good. I have a lot of ideas. I think it's, it's going to be good. Yeah. That's awesome. If you need yeah. any help, uh, I'm happy to offer whatever I can. Yeah, we're going to, I don't know, we're going to probably have to come in on like Thursday or Friday and set up Ruby. So I got, okay. Sounds great. I'm here. What's uh, the Romy? Oh, uh, there's a. Um, Hello Kitty, uh, oh, Real World. Okay. Oh, yeah, yes, the okay. They're they're, look, they're oh, like, kind of burnt through. It's, uh, it's all right, it, it adds to the punk aesthetic, you know, that I'm going to <laughs> you know, it's yeah. fine. And um, spring is here, so and spring is here, <laughs> yeah. Ruby, I am so excited to see that. I saw what I guess was probably your test cut, like in cardboard when I was oh, in the yeah. space. And I was like, this is so cute. I wonder what this is going to be. <laughs> and so it's really cool to, to see what it became. Thanks. Uh, I'm going to, yeah, these are just some like farmer jeans that I bought because I like, I'm going to start painting outside again. Yeah. And I can't use thin like clothes because I'm outside and it's hard. Um, but yeah, these are like covered in paint already. So it doesn't matter. Okay, enough about me. I can go since I'm here. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I made something, I think it's related to what we talked about last week. Let's see, sure. shoot. It doesn't get tall enough to get to the camera. I'm like, what? Um, <laughs> hold on one second. Can, you, can someone can you else go? Up? I think I'm going to try to log on through my phone and yeah. do it. Yeah, someone else go. I can go. Yeah, go for it, Kate. Um, or I can I can try to go. Let's see if this share screen. Nope. Um, sure. Share everything. Yep. Yep. OK. Um, so I played around at with the MIT App Inventor, um, which was really fun, unlike um, some of the other tutorials that I've looked at in the past, I found these to be pretty followable and only had a, a couple questions that I you know, don't have a person that I could answer. I, you know, I'm lucky to have Corey and the class and things like that, but with some tutorials, you're just kind of stuck. Yeah. Um, so I did play around. I did the, the Hello Purr that, that Ruby was talking about with my dog because we pretend she's a cat. I did some whack-a-mole. I started playing around with this idea that I had for about 10 minutes of, of trying to do some sort of like water tracker. Like, are you staying hydrated? Click it when you have water kind of thing. Um, and then this one is called like, get the gold or something. This is another one that they design. And this, or during this one was where I kind of realized that there are places where you can just download the complete code which was really handy by the time that I'd been through three, looking at the complete code, I could then start to read and understand it and be able to modify it. So that was kind of a, a cool option. So I, I had no idea what I wanted to do after the water thing became a mess. So my daughter asked me to make an app where I feed pizza to a cat. So I was like, sure, that's as good an idea of any. And I really began to realize in a very real way, even though I already knew it, that there's a lot that you have to do, a lot of little pieces that go into, like I think about the stupid games that I play on my phone when I'm bored and there's so many pieces and all these levels and all these quests and all these things. And I'm like, I'm just trying to drag a piece of pizza to a cat and there's so many little pieces, like getting things sized and not distorted and making them drag everywhere on the screen and not just left and right. And so uh, there was a lot of that. And so I, but I did finally this afternoon, <laughs> Uh, let's see if this will work, maybe. So you right. drag it over to its mouth, it opens its mouth, then it meows at you. And <laughs> then I got it to close its mouth too, which was like the ridiculously weirdest, hardest part. Um, so so that was my, my week uh, of, of app building. And 
as soon as I finished it, I was actually like, oh, you know, like, well, now I want to make it take a bite out of the pizza. And now, you know, and I saw that as a, as a kind of good sign that like, yeah. I felt like, okay, I could mostly complete a thing that I had an idea and I have ideas how that I could continue to modify it and work with it. Um, so that was my app week. And I also, since Ruby reminded me of this, I also um, did this uh, through the, the, the denim thing. Um, I don't know if you can see this, but uh, Ruby helped me. There was initially some problem with basic laser focusing, but I was able to make a couple little banners for COVID that uh, I engraved onto jeans and they went well. So that was an exciting, fun little side piece. That is lovely. And what I, I love that you're, that you felt that way about the apps at the end. Uh, it was really neat to be the reach out person at the, you know, at the end of the day today, I was um, able to chat with you a little bit and I wasn't very helpful, but it was really, it was exciting to be along for the ride. And I'm, uh, it makes me happy that you're, that when you finish, like that's, that's great feedback. When you feel like you're making enough progress that it's self-rewarding that you want to go on and learn more. That's such an exciting, such an exciting place. My internet is unstable. Yeah. All right, I think I'm kind of ready to go, but are you, is that is it okay? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Good point. Nope. All right. Ooh. I mean, this. Can you see that? Yeah, totally. Is it? Hold on. I need to reset it. It's frozen. Nope. Even frozen, it looks super impressive. It sure it's does. a weather station, or it's supposed to be a weather station. There it is. Feel like yeah. Really. So is it going to the internet and getting the weather and then just putting it on that little screen? Yeah, and of course now it's like freezing while it's dealing with you. Reset. Live demos are always supposed to go bad. You're doing yeah. great. All right. Exactly. I saw that it had a temperature before. <laughs> Yeah, and then it, it like it froze. So it does this where it gets stuck on this screen for maybe 30 seconds and it says it's 1970. Oh, sure. And uh, I don't think this information on this terrain is correct either. There's a couple things going on that I'm not sure if it's doing it right. But um, yeah, so it's pulling information from local weather and it's telling you the next three days and then it tells you the local time. That's so cool. Yeah. All right. Uh, that is really spot on what we were talking about last week. Okay. You nailed it on getting information from the internet. You're outputting it. So like in terms of an interface, there's no control, but it's all software feedback that you're getting, which is really cool. So you were like, all right, look at you already thinking about this week's stuff. Yeah. Oh, hold on. I thought I need to get out of here. Oh, yep. How do I get okay. it? I saw a message. OK. Um, I wanted to say also, when I was making like my site for Makehaven, which I haven't touched in forever, my logo started out as maybe like a green color. And I went to one of the Linda's um, CSS tutorials I did mention this site. And I actually took the reddish brown of the Makehaven logo to base my color scheme for my website off of. And my logo ended up yellow. And yellow is probably my least favorite color, but it kind of went, so it worked. Yeah. But that's a neat um, site to do um, pick your color schemes for websites. Yeah, and it's called Coolers, C-O-O-L-E-R. I can't hear anything. Can anyone hear oh. anything? No, probably I'm. I don't hear anything. Hold on. We, we can hear you, Corey. 
Okay. Yeah. It's, it's, I was just reading off the, it's coolers, C O O L uh, O R S dot C O for anybody who's watching this video later. <laughs> Lila's gone. Let's see. Oh, and then uh, cooler K U L E R is another one that's good to use. There's a ton of them, like color paletter. Col if you do web color paletter in a Google search, you'll find like a hundred of these because it's an interesting little coding project to figure out. So it's neat. Yeah, the... Oh, here we go. Are we back? Good. Yeah, sorry about that. No, you're good. You're totally fine. Uh, Adobe Color is, a, is another one. There's, there's tons of them. Color palletizer. Uh, let's see. Sorry. Uh, let's see. We got Jamie and Anna who could still present if you wanted to tell us a little bit about things that you've been up to and maybe cool stuff that you've been doing. Um, no. I'll All right. I muted you, Corey. We should be okay. Um, cool. Well, this week I I tried two different things. Um, I have this add a fruit um, Bluetooth. I think it's a Bluetooth Wi-Fi feather um but it's really hard to use it you know we 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 tried um um yeah i tried hooking it up to my iphone it's supposed to work with the iphone that's why i bought it um because i wanted to actually program it from my phone but that's not a possibility um it's not the usability and the design is horrible. In fact, the company gave me my money back and said, just keep it. We like, it, yeah, the documentation isn't that great. Even though there's a lot of it, it, nothing seemed to really work well. So I tried and there were some successes, um, just trying to get the pins to output, you know, turn on and off. It was just very sketchy and buggy and, it was, it was fun though, just to experiment and learn from like good design and bad design. So the usability of that, I would give an F. Um, then from there, I just wanted to learn how to get onto my Pi um, from my phone. Um, that is still kind of up in the air. I know how to get on the Pi from another computer or my phone if I have the IP address. So I know how to SSH into it and then control it from my phone or another computer, which is really cool. That was like my, my goal for the week was just to get good at doing that one thing and get my muscle memory, um, just the process of that from my phone or another computer. Um, Corey and I tried to, I tried also at home another technique to try to get the IP address to just display on my little pie screen. This is my pie computer. Um, so what I wanna do is plug it in and just have the IP address show up so that I can then access it and control it from my phone, um, which is great. And then I don't need a mouse and a bunch of other things like a keyboard to carry around. I can just carry this box and a power cable or a battery, you know, and I'm good to go. Um, so that's still a project in the works. And I looked at the MIT website and Flask and just got too overwhelmed. But I watched a few videos on it and would really like to come back to all that stuff. There's just not enough time in a week to 
become a master in any one of those things, but it was good to look into what's possible. It looks like you're unmuted, Corey, but we can't hear you. Oh, can you hear me now? Yeah. Um, I think turn off your volume. Yeah, I'm going to turn it off. We're in a time warp. All right. So the there's tons of really cool things to do. And flat, like for all of this web server business, there's no reasonable way that anyone would be able to internalize it in a week. I am definitely not a master of it. Uh, I could probably have a much higher income if I was able to be a webmaster instead of a teacher. Maybe not quite as emotionally fulfilling, but you know. It would, that would, that's its own whole other discussion. The, there are lots of things to explore. And so spending time sort of circling back on Flask or Node or any of those is a really interesting platform. I'm real, I think that there's lots to learn there. But Ileana, what have you been, what have you been up to? And I wanna hear all your thoughts on design things because you've got, you're, you're a pro. Um, so I haven't really been able to do anything separately but i did realize that what i'm doing for work uh which i might have kate stop recording because i don't think this is technically allowed to be shown i could do this for work we just started recording again and i just want to say to anyone who's watching this recorded uh iliana just showed us how this works i talked about it and she just made it happen in front of us her her work emails that she's sending are phenomenal uh, I just, I needed to glow a little bit about that. Jamie's coming to clap in the background. Totally earned. Um, that's phenomenal. There, yeah, there's, that's, wow. Okay, uh, so everybody try, there's the bar, try and hit it. <laughs> uh, yeah, very high. That's, that's awesome. Um, oh, I've also wanted to mention that if, um, for the more art related people who are having trouble thinking about this, um, if you know anything about animation, you know, it's frame by frame by frame and every incremental movement you have to account for. If you think of apps like animation, you have to think of the next frame. Um, that's very linear, but I, I'm assuming like most of the apps that people are doing are pretty linear, but another way you can do it is essentially use the post-it note method where you have your main screen, and that's one post-it note. And if somebody, every button is then a subsequent post-it going out in a certain direction. So you can actually plot out paths for buttons, like, like okay, so this button does this, and then you have another post-it. But if they hit this button, it does this, and you have another post-it. And then like you kind of create a tree. And then I used to do that on a wall, and that kind of made it a lot easier for me to visualize, because I'm a very visual person. Um, but yeah, I thought of it like animation where you're thinking of like, where are my cuts? Where are my edits? Where, like, what is the next movement? Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, it's, it's completely, it's completely a language that we have manifest for ourselves by way of having such a visual context for communicating. Um, yeah, it's incredible. I just have to say that I'm astounded to see like the, I thought the first one looked really good and was really impressive from like the amount of coding and all that kind of stuff that you learned and then to see in this short period of time the growth and change and understanding and as far as reaching people and understanding how they are going to receive it was astonishing like very impressive. I think yeah. it's like a car nerd too like I'm sure the rules still apply but like reading stuff isn't bad. Uh, you know, I know there's graphs in there. Maybe there's something I could learn, right? Like, I think like as a car guy, like wanting to have the best information to sound smart and like know what what is actually happening. I, th I think that that could be really valuable. So I, I, I'm just speaking candidly, like I wanted to read them. So 
know? Yeah. 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 But I, I, the logic totally makes sense of like graph first words later. Mm. <laughs> it was very pretty to look at. I was captivated. I mean that. <laughs> Not I'm just little imagining little. The, the like the Cosmo version, like, you know, 10 things your car wants, you know, <laughs> or like whatever, just anyway. I super appreciate everything that everyone said, because like the only feedback I got from work was like, yeah, it looks good. That's oh. great. Like, move on to the next thing, please. <laughs> so <laughs> I don't think they realize like all of the iteration. I don't think they realize they actually look all that different <laughs> um, apart from that. So I really appreciate the feedback. Yeah, especially yeah. like there was a lot of things that I that I took away that I was like, oh, I wish I was recording this just so I could watch it again, not post it. But um, like the 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 thing that looked like a button but was actually a whole image where you could click anywhere. I was like, that is such a simple thing, but it's just like, oh, of course, make it a big thing. So if your you know clumsy old thumb misses the button, you've you've still got the click. I mean. It, very smart. Yeah, that definitely resonated with me also. Like the the big dumb thumb that I have will will miss buttons and like it doesn't work right. Uh, but if it's a big enough button, I'll, I'll I might even hit it by accident. So <laughs> that that's actually uh, when it comes to emails, a lot of email clients now are making it so that you have to opt into seeing the images. So while they started to look better and they were more user friendly, I'm actually running the risk of people not seeing any of those images because they're not like they don't have Gmail doesn't necessarily do that all the time unless you turn it on. But there are other email clients. I think Outlook does it. Where if you open something in Outlook, it won't show you the images. You have to tell it like, please show me images. Ooh, I have a follow up question to that does outlook send a flag is there a test you can run in the html of the website that says if supports images do this and if not you have an svg of like an inline svg where it's not an external file it's not loading anything else but like a car shape you know a, like a placeholder like there used to be the egg for the twitter profile for people something so, like that where you could take up the space so, they will so, there is, I just, I haven't figured out how to code it correctly because I have SVGs to be there, but it's not reading them as SVGs for some reason. It just, I end up with like a image not found. I'll send um, you a link for inline SVGs on W3School so that you can see like how to just plop them into your HTML. Okay, I will look that up. I'm writing yeah. it down right now. In inline SVGs. And then they're just part of the code for the page. They're not an external file that needs loaded. Okay. It's also because I'm, like I said, like email coding is really dumb. It's a really dumb version of like the logic for some of the stuff doesn't make sense. Um, I can also send a plain text HTML version of an email, which is just all words and links. Yeah. So I have to make sure that I have every image has to have a description in case somebody has plain text HTML email activated, which I don't think they do, but just in case, so that everything that they don't see, they can read. But that's also really good for screen readers because screen readers yeah. will pick up on image descriptions, but there's only so much I can fit without running out of characters. So it's like this weird game I have to play where it's like, okay, how many of our users are blind if they're car people? So. Yeah. How much am I optimizing this for screen readers if maybe like 0.1% of our users are, or our customers are blind? Mm -hmm. But like, it's like this weird game I have to play where it's like, I want this to be accessible on a, like from a personal standpoint, but at the same time, I also have to like work within the context. Yes, like Braille at the drive through like, uh, so I have to work within the context of the email, like HTML structure, which is different from a web. It's it's similar, but it's like HTML from like the two thousands. It's like not yeah. even HTML five. Yeah, <laughs> that makes sense. Yeah, there's yeah, that is fascinating for sure. There's a whole bunch of limitations. A good so inline SVGs have been around for a long time. 
So that should hopefully be helpful. Uh, but what an interesting set of problems. And I've totally had to do that before with plain text HTML. When I, my, the borrow bot sends, like forgot my password emails and I had to write them in both formats and they're automatically, they're code generated. So they're emails that are built from a database, but I had to write it in both contexts so that it could run it with or without the HTML. And that is a, that was a new struggle to me at the time. Uh, but it is totally a thing that you have to do. And, it, and it's not just like a drop in and click. I'm sure that that's more stressful when it's a job, not like a weird fun hobby. But I'm also sure you're crushing it. You're doing great. <laughs> yeah. We are proud. That's right. Oh man. So, so you just completely showed us how to do all of this. That's awesome. Um, yeah. Uh, well, let's see. Other other news that's important. We're pretty much done. Let's see. Next week is Bio Week. If there's a week to come in and be physically here, I think next week might be it because we're going to have Kyle is here already for his office hours. Oh, well, he's here a lot. Kyle Glos. And then Nora is, I, Nora Pen, Pen, Nora's going to be here. I don't know, Nora P. And so I think that they're both intending to be here or around for class time. And with the bio week, there's a very prescribed activity, not like this week where it's just sort of like interface, whatever. Uh, Next week is we're going to swab the inside of your cheek. We're going to do a PCR test on your DNA to, to, re, to rebuild your own DNA. Then we're going to do gel electrophoresis on your DNA so that not only do you get to see, you get to swab your DNA, you get to extract your DNA, you get to copy your own DNA, and then you're going to see it turn into a fingerprint in a gel. So like you'll see your own DNA made into a physical thing in front of you. It's going to be cool. Uh, but Is there a fun gonna, murder mystery involved? I hope not. <laughs> but there, I mean, we could totally do that if we wanted to. You could, you could absolutely make it a part of the game at the end. It, but there's like incubation periods and some of those things that have to be managed. And to be clear, I'm definitely wading out of my depth a little bit on the technical specifics of this. So the, the guidance from the facilitators is going to be really valuable next week. Being here to talk with them is going to be helpful. Also, and this is maybe in, in our news, the second vaccine shot for me is happening Thursday. And then the follow, so, and then next week is going to be also my, yeah, it's very exciting. Uh, this, so Thursday of this week, and then next week, Carolyn and I are going hiking in the Catskills. And so I'm going to be out of, out of touch for a little bit because this is, you know, it's nice to, to actually get to be in a place. So I'll be a little bit out of touch for a few days from like third, we leave on Thursday and we come back on Sunday. So like in my normal office hours time, I'll be, I'll be in the Catskills wandering through the mountains, enjoying time outside away from humans, but in a new place where the, the scenery is, is very nice. So Sorry, that's this Thursday, the eighth that you're I get vaccinated on the eighth, and next week is when I'll be out of town, which feels like the best time to do it because the facilitators are way more helpful than I will be on the bio week anyways. So if there's a week to and it, it just happened to be that way, but if if it's a good week for it to be true. So that that is definitely exciting things going on. And I, I hope fingers crossed that you've all got appointments, that you're able to get those appointments. We're past the window where you can call right now, but if anybody wants help signing up, getting subscribed, whatever, Kate will help, I will help. Uh, anybody, anytime, if you want help getting vaccinated or just chatting about like what's the safety or info or any of those things, you want to talk to me about it as a science teacher, I can do that. You want to talk to Carolyn, I can connect those dots. Um, she'd, I'm sure, be happy to talk to any of you. I can report back on the Johnson & Johnson since I got that one. Oh, yeah, yeah. How was that? one dose and um, and as many people are finding, um, pretty much no side effects. Like little bit of soreness like you may get with a, with a flu shot, a little bit of soreness, I mean, in my arm specifically, but really nothing else. I took the next morning off and had nothing to do and ended up going into Make Haven anyway, because 
it was fun and I was totally fine. So that's exciting. That's awesome. Yeah, the for Moderna, which is the one I took, I had a sore arm on the first one and I've already scheduled to take Friday off because I expect to be pretty down for the count. I've heard like shivering and, and an uncomfortable 12 hours, but then once you're past that, you're fine. Like you go to bed and then you wake up and it's all gone, um, which, is, which is exciting. Another, another thing that's worth mentioning, and this is more like insider perspective that, that probably should not be recorded, is that the, let's see, we'll see the lady people and stay safe in the meantime, and we'll, we'll be good to go. Good, if you get a two shot system, by the time you're ready for the second shot, you're 80% protected. And the second shot is really there to like make it the 95 and to last for maybe up to five years. So that's very exciting. It's, it's coming. We're, we're close, people. It could be a very good summer. It could be a summer <laughs> yeah. at all. I'll take a summer at all. You know? <laughs> yeah, not one long March. True.